It's my pleasure to introduce uh, our next speaker, uh, Professor Go Buncha. Uh, Dr. Go is a senior clinician and scientist uh, at the National University Hospital and the National University of Singapore. Um, he is uh, well established in a few of our head and neck oncology. Um, he's the lead medical oncologist at our weekly tumor board and sees uh, many of our head and neck cancer patients. Um, he has mentored many clinical oncology and pharmacology fellows and has been awarded the Senior Clinician Scientist Award from the NMRC since uh, 2005. He also leads uh, several uh, Phase 1 and 2 clinical trials uh, right here in NUH and in multiple global consortiums. And uh, it's my pleasure to invite him to give us a primer on uh, immunotherapy uh, specifically for surgeons. Thank you, Prof. Go. Okay. Yeah. Um, so thank you very much, uh, Jimmy. Joshua, Melissa, for the uh, kind uh, invitation to this uh, uh, surgical conference. And um, in the next 40 minutes or so, I'd like to take you through some of the comments I have of immunotherapy as a review um, to, uh, to, uh, and it's how it has changed our practice. Now, of course, it's foolhardy for me to try and cover the whole realm of immunotherapy in just 40 minutes. It will be in incredibly difficult um, to describe, begin to describe what has actually happened in the past decade. So in, 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 in that setting, I'm just going to cover about four points today. One is the origins and the, de the development of modern era immunotherapy. The second is uh, biomarkers that we use for immune checkpoint uh, therapy. And the third is uh, addressing some of the resistance uh, mechanisms to immunotherapy and then beyond immune checkpoint therapy. Okay, so bear with me for the next 40 minutes. Okay, uh, immunotherapy essentially is not new art. It started in the 1800s, so 1891, and it was an American pioneering surgeon, okay, not an oncologist. In those days, no oncologist, all surgeons, right? And he was the first one to use heat inactivated bacteria to treat a patient who had unresectable head and neck cancer. And to his surprise, a few uh, years later, the patient is still well, went back to work. And that gave rise to what we call Cooley's toxin. But in those days, what happened was chemotherapy was coming up, radiotherapy was coming up, and because these had more effect on tumors, therefore immunotherapy was put into the background. And it was not until 1992 that we saw the first product of immunotherapy that became FDA approved for treatment of renal cell carcinoma as well as melanoma, and this is IL-2. And we used to use IL-2 for treatment of uh, renal cell carcinoma. What we learned was, number one, it's highly toxic. Capillary leak syndrome is super high. Um, however, and the response rate is super low, it's in the single digits. However, in the patients whom it worked, the, there was durable response. So that was an, already an indication that you can actually turn the immune system uh, against treatment of cancer. Uh, to, towards treatment of cancer. And this actually led to further work that resulted in two Nobel Prizes. One, Ralph Steinman's work in uh, uncovering dendritic cells as the professional antigen presenting cells for T cell priming against the, the tumor. And two, the, the, the use of immune checkpoint inhibitors for treatment of, uh, of cancer by two very esteemed professors. Honjo and Ellison, for which they well deservedly won the Nobel Prize in 2018. Since actually it took a long time, okay, and the first turning point was in 2010 when ipilimumab, which was the first immunotherapy called uh, against, is it, actually an anti CTLA4 antibody, showed uh, in, uh, improved survival in malignant melanoma in patients who already uh, lost all chances of survival. And it led to the approval of ipilimumab uh, in melanoma in 2011. And you can see initially, uh, there's a pointer here, right? So initially it was very slow growing, but subsequently you can see the development of NTPD1 and NTPDL1 antibodies and increasing number of indications that, that were approved for, for, for use clinically. And this was only up to 2018. Subsequent to that, uh, from 2018, you can see an explosion of approvals in various other cancers. And I must mention that these are very difficult to treat cancers. So cancers that were traditionally considered very difficult to treat, it was the barriers were being broken by immunotherapy. And since then, now the current situation is that we have thousands of trials in immunotherapy. And um, it, it basically built on the backbone of immune checkpoint inhibitors. 
combining them with other immunotherapies as well as other uh, modalities of treatment in cancer. And this is highly exciting times for medical oncologists using immunotherapy. Now, since this uh, immune checkpoint blockade has become so, um, uh, uh, has had such a big impact on cancer, it deserves some mention of how it works actually. So what's the mechanism of uh, action? So as it happens, the immune system, when it's activated against cancer, um, calibrates itself such that you have a set, uh, and this calibration is by a set of priming antigens that result in T-cell activation, and it's balanced uh, or calibrated by negative uh, immune fact, uh, pathways called immune checkpoints. And the whole idea of this is that you don't want the immune system to overactivate because otherwise you get autoimmune disease, you get overstimulation. So our bodies have evolved to have this kind of checkpoints. What happens is the cancer, being very smart, has actually hijacked or subverted these immune checkpoints for its advantage and uh, used this for immune evasion. So two of the largest, uh, two of the most important uh, checkpoints are as follows. So, so this is where T cell activation happens. Uh, upon uh, encounter, uh, antigen presenting cell encountering a T cell, uh, what happens is the antigen presenting cell uh, presents the, 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 the tumor antigen on its surface together with the MHC, and this binds to the cognate TCR, and this sends a positive signal to the T cell to activate. However, this is insufficient. You require a second signal, which is called the co-stimulatory signal. And this signal is sent by a B7 a ligand that binds to CD28 on the T cell. Now, the negative uh, uh, modulators include a PDL, PDL1 axis, PD1, PDL1 axis, as well as a T CTLA4 axis. So, in, the in, if in a T cell that has been overactivated, it expresses CTLA4 receptors, which then compete with the B B7, uh, compete with the, the CD28 for the binding to B7 ligands, and this sends a negative signal, dampening the immune response. In the tumor microenvironment, what happens is a T cell that shows exhaustion expresses PD1 receptors, and the tumor cells that, uh, that produce PDL1 will then bind to it and inhibit the, T regulatory, uh, the TCR activation of, the, of, of T cells therefore uh, causing immune evasion. And the uh, two treatment modalities that I mentioned, anti-PDL1, PDL, uh, PD1 antibodies, basically block these two pathways that result in an unleashing the breaks against the cancer, and therefore the T cell can recognize the cancer and then attack it. So these are, this is the mechan basic mechanism of how it works. Now before I go on, I think it's important to mention two basic tenets of immunotherapy that will help us to understand um, how um, resistance can happen. So if you uh, thought, if you think that the, the immune system is there, it's able to kill tumor cells, then how did the immune system fail to control cancer? How did the cancer come about in the first place? And this uh, framework, called, uh, this uh, concept called immune, immunoediting was proposed in uh, the year about 2002. And in this uh, framework, what happens is it, is it it explains why the immune system has a dual function. In some circumstances, it kills the tumor. In other circumstances, it seems to promote the proliferation of the tumor. And this is explained as follows. So there are three phases of the immune cycle. So in the early phase, when a tumor uh, evolves, when a tumor initiates, what happens is that it incites an, uh, an immune response the T cells then are brought in and kills the tumor, and, and, and you don't see the tumor uh, clinically. And this is what you call this, the state of elimination. But because cancer cells uh, have genomic instability, they acquire mutations, and because the mutations keep happening, what happens is essentially there is a loss of the innate immunity. And in, this, in, the, in the situation where there's an equilibrium, this is where the tumor remains dormant, but activates the adaptive immune response and this equilibrium uh, leads to uh, the cancer being kept in check, dormant. It's eventually what happens that antigen loss, NMHC loss leads to a, a breakdown of this immune recognition, and therefore you see a clinical tumor, and this is why I call immune escape. So this and the mechanisms that surround and uh, regulate this process are the ones that you want to target or reverse or use against the cancer. 
The second concept that I want to uh, promote here or, or, or explain here is the concept of the cancer immune cycle. And we use this to help with our understanding of how the immune system is activated against uh, the cancer. So it all starts at the tumor bed where the tumor cells uh, undergo lysis, release tumor antigens, and these antigens are then picked up by the antigen presenting cells. The antigen presenting cells or dendritic cells then traverse, tra travel through the blood, lymphatics, goes to the surrounding lymph nodes where they encounter naive T cells. They activate the naive T cells and the T cells are then trafficked back via the blood vessels into the tumor bed. Uh, the, the, the prime T cells now recognize the tumor cells and release grand, uh, interferon gamma is released, perforin is released, and granzyme is released, and therefore the tumor cells lyse. Now, this whole cancer immunity cycle is regulated by positive um, um, regulators in green in every step of the way, as well as negative uh, regulators in red every step of the way. So an understanding of these mechanisms and these regulators allows us to then work mechanisms against the cancer and this is how the field of immunotherapy uh, will eventually evolve. Okay, well, I, I wanted to show some pictures but uh, well, it didn't come out very well. So what have we learned from immune checkpoint inhibitors after having used them for the past decade? Number one, there's considerable variability of efficacy across tumor types. Some, some tumors simply don't respond and I'll come to that in a while. Um, number two, there's the possibility of pseudo-progression during early phases of treatment. So unlike chemotherapy, you give the drug, you see a response, or you don't see a response. In immunotherapy, sometimes you see the tumors grow a bit larger. Sometimes you even see mixed responses, and you're wondering to yourself, is it working, is it not working? If you wait for a little while, the tumors will actually respond. And the reason is the initial response is one of T immune T cell infiltration in the tumor, causing the tumor to blush. So we have to take that into consideration whenever we do clinical trials on immunotherapy. It's some, a concept of pseudo progression, and therefore we use something called IR RACIS for our, our measurements rather than the RACIS. Number three, we learn a lot about how to manage immune uh, adverse events. We learn how to manage CRS. We learn how to use tocilizumab. We learn how to call the, the immunologist when we need. Okay. Number four is, as I mentioned, immunotherapy is different from uh, radiation therapy or chemotherapy in the sense that you can sometimes see durable responses and the potential treatment beyond progression. The trial which I mentioned uh, in 2011, the use of ipilimumab in melanoma, about 30% of patients are still alive today, which is one decade later, in a situation of refractoriness to standard treatment. That is what immunotherapy can do. And, and another, another thing that we have observed is that there may be overall survival despite no increase in progression survival, progression-free survival. In other words, you can see the tumors actually slowly growing and therefore progression-free survival is, is short. However, you see an overall survival benefit in a patient. Now, how do you explain that? Essentially, what you have done is that you have modulated the biology of growth of the tumor. You have slowed it down such that the patient survives longer. Um, the other thing is, we are currently not sure what is the duration of treatment in patients who are responding. Uh, the standard is to give the treatment for two, the immune checkpoint blockade for two years, but essentially, we have no idea whether to stop at that point. And the, la the last thing that we've learned is eventually some tumors become resistant. Now, perhaps the most sobering, uh, so uh, sobering um, lesson that we've learned is that uh, amongst all the benefits that we see in immunotherapy, um, only a very small proportion of patients actually benefit. So these are the survival curves of four pivotal studies in non-small cell lung cancer that led to the approval of these agents. Uh, for treatment of non-small cell lung cancer. And if you see the survival curves, indeed, they are superior to conventional chemotherapy. However, only the patients who survive long-term are the ones who, who, who benefited. The ones who died at the top, they are not the ones who benefited. About 70% of patients do not benefit. So how could we address this problem? One is that we need to develop better biomarkers to predict who are the ones who will belong to this category of people who clinically benefit. 
And two is we need to define the resistance mechanisms of these others who do not benefit. And that is how we advance uh, uh, further you know, treatment of, of cancer with immunotherapy. Now, first I would like to deal with biomarkers. And the biomarkers that have been used, there are many of them. And um, of, of these many biomarkers that are used, about three of them are clinically used nowadays and you hear of them in your tumor boards. Um, the first is pdl one expression by IHC. The second is uh, something called a tumor mutational burden, which is measured uh, following an NGS analysis. And the third is uh, MMR or mismatch repair uh, uh, protein expression. I'll, I'll come to this one by one. Um, the, the other uh, biomarkers that have been uh, developed are essentially largely are still under uh, evaluation at this point of time, um, but very promising in, their, in, their, uh, as it, in, in that they uh, reflect the mechanisms of immunotherapy. So first, I'd like to talk about PDL1 as a biomarker. Now, PDL1, as you know, is of course the, tar uh, uh, the target of uh, PD inhibition of a PD1, PDL1 axis. Um, and, as it, uh, uh, and clinical trials have taught us that the increasing expression of PDL1 in the tumor, uh, predicts for an uh, overall resp uh, response to the tumor. And here I will show you the, the, the uh, results of Keynote 189 in non small cell lung cancer, where increasing uh, expression of PD PDL1 is uh, measured by the TPS or tumor proportion score. So here is less than 1%, here 1 to 49, more than 50. You see an increasing response rate. And this uh, clinical manifestation of improvement is also seen in the progression-free survival, meaning that you get a greater impact on the uh, tumor survival by in with increasing TPS score or increasing PDL1 expression. Same thing is seen in overall survival. Okay, um, and um, the second is tumor mutational burden as a biomarker. Now, I've just told you that some tumors actually do not respond. In fact, most tumors actually don't respond. Um, if you had a tumor that has New, it has a high tumor mutational burden, meaning there is a lot of uh, new tumor new antigens being expressed because of mutations as a result of genomic instability of a tumor. These are the tumors that have the potential to respond simply because the opportunities for T cell activation are higher. So some tumor types like cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma arising because of sun exposure. No, non -color, uh, uh, colorectal or non colorectal cancers that have mismatched de uh, 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 repair defects. Melanoma. Now, these are the uh, tumors that traditional carry, tr traditionally carry a high tumor mutational burden and are likely to respond. As you can see, this graph actually shows you um, the tumors that have uh, okay, the op overall objective response according to the number of mutations per megabase, which is a measure of the tumor mutational burden. On the other hand, at the other end of the curve, you have some tumors that are traditionally really resistant to immunotherapy, like uveal melanoma, pancreatic cancer, uh, childhood uh, cancers in the brain. These are the ones who carry very fine, uh, or EGFR mutant, mutant lung cancer, for example. They don't have many mutations, and because of that, they don't really respond so well to immunotherapy. So tumor mutational burden as a biomarker of response is defined as a total, total number of non-synonymous mutations per coding area. Usually it's expressed in the form of number of mutations per megabase. It is uh, the gold standard of uh, measuring this is whole exome sequencing, but of course we don't do whole exome sequencing for tumors. So that an extrapolation of this is uh, uh, when we do targeted comprehensive genomic profiling, like for example with the foundation one assay, they will give you a readout on the tumor mutational burden in terms of number of mutations per megabase. However, there are challenges. What are the challenges? Harmonization between gene panels, somatic mutations require filtering of germline polymorphisms. Obviously, the, tumor, the, the immune system will not respond to germline polymorphisms. There are SA considerations, bio, bioinformatics support needed, and what is actually considered high TMB. So an example of an, a study that has used tumor mutational burden is Checkmate 227, non-small cell lung cancer study first line, where, we were, where, where the, the patients all had low PDL1 expression, randomized to nivolumab, epinevo, or chemo. And they, they basically analyzed the patients according to foundation one CDX to, exp, uh, to assess TMB. And those which have higher TMB 
um, had a higher progression-free survival compared to chemotherapy and compared to uh, uh, the ones that had lower TMB scores. So because of this, um, uh, EP Nevo is actually approved for patients who have a high TMB of more than 10 mut mutants per megabase pair. The, uh, the last uh, biomarker I'd like to talk about is uh, mismatch repair genes. So mismatch, there's a, a group of tumors which carry, uh, which arise in patients who have like Lynch syndrome. And in Lynch syndrome, what happens is, is that there are polymorphisms that result in the deletion or the non-expression of a set of four um, uh, mismatch repair genes. And because these mismatch repair genes are deficient, what happens is this, the ability to repair DNA damage is, is impaired. These patients have high tumor mutational burden and they are the ones who respond to, to immunotherapy. So how do we measure mismatch repair? Two ways of doing so. One is using immunohistochemistry to uh, stain for the presence or absence of the four mismatch repair genes, proteins. And the other is to do uh, a sequencing or genotyping assay to look for about five different microsatellite areas. And in, if you have two or more of these sites showing microsatellite instability, is considered a microsatellite instable, or what we call MSI high tumor. If you have these two situations, the response to immunotherapy is expected to be high. And I'll show you the, uh, the evidence for this. So you could not have told that a tumor had an MSI high or an MSI low uh, um, um, situation just by looking at it uh, immunohistologically. So the tumors that tend to have uh, MSI high or tend to happen in patients with Lynch syndrome are of course colorectal cancer, small, cell lung, uh, small bowel cancers, endometrial prostate, and so on. And uh, these patients tend, may have uh, uh, mismatch repair deficiencies. Whatever it is, a study was done using pembrolizumab across a range of MSI high or DMMR uh, patient, uh, uh, cancers. And the efficacy of pembrolizumab was established by showing an overall response rate of about 40%. And most importantly, the duration of response was actually more than six months in these patients. So it's a nice proof of principle that uh, MSI high or D DMMR patients do respond to immunotherapy. And of course, you all know, Keynote 177 study, phase three study, first line colorectal cancer, uh, just looking at patients with mismatch repair deficiency or MSI high patients. So comparing pembrolizumab single mono agent therapy versus chemotherapy, which is standard, you find that uh, the immunotherapy was superior in terms of uh, overall survival in this group of patients. So this nicely shows again, immunotherapy in the correct select subgroup actually in, uh, uh, gives rise to a positive uh, response. Now I'd like to sp uh, change, spin the wheel around and talk a bit about the mechanisms of resistance to immunotherapy. Now how immunotherapy resistance is a very complex issue, but looking at it from the clinical point of view, you can actually categorize patients into about largely about four different categories. The ones, the, the first is the patients who you give immuno, uh, immunotherapy like checkpoint inhibition, and you, so, you see nothing happens to tumor, absolutely nothing, no response at all. The second is the ones where you give immunotherapy and you see, T, uh, you see T cell infiltration, you see a tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, but subsequently adaptive uh, resistance happens and then the tumors become resistant. The third is uh, the bottom panels are the ones that have an initial response to uh, immunotherapy, but subsequently the patients become resistant and, in and, and two situations happen. One is the immunotherapy pressure leads to the elimination of sensitive cells but because of geno uh, and but because some of the genome, some of the cells do not express tumor neoantigens, they then repopulate the tumor, and you see you, it presents as a secondary resistance. Second situation is where the cells actually evolve because of genomic instability, and this genomic instability leads to a loss of immune uh, activation, and therefore again resistance happens. A lot of work is being done to uncover some of these mechanisms and. They can be divided largely into the ones that affect the tumor cell or the ones that affect the, the tumor microenvironment. 
And the ones that affect the tumor cell could be because of the absence or loss of antigenic proteins, a problem with the antigen presentation here because you actually lose uh, beta-2 microglobulin, which is a part of the uh, antigen-presenting apparatus, or it could be because the tumors express uh, or, or uh, have aberrant um, oncogenic signaling, and this signaling le leads to T-cell exclusion, or it could be an insensibility to T-cells by uh, mutations in the response pathways that, like for example, the tumor has a mutation in interferon gamma and it doesn't produce interferon gamma. Now, external processes in the tumor microenvironment may account for this uh, resistance, and this could include upregulation of other immune checkpoints. It could be uh, 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 in increasing uh, polarization of the immune cells to T regulatory and MDSCs rather than uh, immune active cells, and these are again some of the mechanisms that we can tackle. Whatever it is, these are very difficult to study, right? You will admit it's really difficult to study. So the question is, can we just use immunohistochemistry to just try and pick out some of these immune resistance mechanisms? And the answer is essentially yes, based on a, a, based on a concept of a tumor immune immunophenotype. So if you did an IHC on a, on a patient's tumor, and if you looked and, and saw that there were no tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, you would uh, classify this tumor as an immune desert, and in this situation, the likely mechanism is that there are there is no there are no antigens, no tumor antigens, and and this would be seen in, for example, childhood malignancies, and in this situation, how, how do you activate a tumor? You need to anti provide new antigens to prime the tumor. The second situation is that you see tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, but they are all on the periphery, doesn't get into the tumor, and why? Because you have expression of uh, VGF, for example, and there's no trafficking of these immune cells into a tumor, therefore uh, it's called immune excluded. In this situation, you can use uh, anti-VGF therapy to improve the tumor T-cell trafficking. And the last is the ones that have actually got all the tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, but nothing is happening. Now, what is that situation? Uh, what, what is happening there is that the tumor uh, is expressing a lot of neg negative uh, uh, immune resistance mechanisms uh, uh, like what I uh, uh, explained just now. And you have to actually attack some of these and understand some of these mechanisms in order to overcome this resistance. Now, I've so far spoke a lot about uh, uh, NTPD1 and CTLA4 blockade, so immune checkpoint blockade, but immunotherapy beyond these checkpoint blockade uh, and I will tell you is extremely exciting, and I'll go through some of them. The first is that uh, PD-1, CTLA-4 axis are not the only immune checkpoints. They do the most of the activity of suppressing uh, the immune response, but there are other checkpoints that fine-tune the immune system. And examples here are like anti-TGIT, lac VISTA, or tin these are basically immune checkpoints that can result in as immune escape as well. And many studies, many products are being developed against this. You can also look at uh, 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 T-cell agonists, and one of them is like anti, uh, uh, C CD137 uh, agonist antibodies, and these are in clinical trials as well. Two of them have stopped, uh, one of them is still go ongoing. Okay, um, oncolytic therapy, uh, we have heard about this uh, from Edmund just a while ago. I'd like to explain how this works. Basically, there are some viruses which can preferentially attack tumor cells and kill them and cause them lysis while sparing the healthy cell population. And you ask, how can that be so? Essentially, this oncolytic virus enters the tumor cells. Um, in the healthy normal cells, you have a viral sensing mechanism. And the viral sensing mechanism then gets rid of the virus and the cells survive. But these, because of the genomic um, aberrations in tumor cells, this sensing mechanism is not there. And therefore, this gives rise to some kind of selectivity towards tumor cell killing. And on top of that, some of these oncolytic viruses can be uh, genetically engineered for, to express uh, immune stimulant uh, anti, uh, uh, proteins, for example, GMCSF. So one of these oncolytic viruses has been approved in, clinical, in, in the clinic for use, and this telemogene, which is TVAC for short, and this is used for unresectable uh, melanoma, and it carries, uh, is genetically modified to express uh, GMCSF to promote immune uh, spreading. 
And this is an example of how it works. So basically, you have a patient with a heel uh, melanoma, you give injections, and then after six months, it actually goes down, and after 12 months, it's a very, very, impro uh, very impressive response. Adoptive T-cell therapy has been studied largely by uh, Saul Rosenberg uh, and, uh, at the NIH, and the way it works is this. The patients come in, refractory tumors, you excise the tumors, um, you pick out the T-cells, and the T-cells are then uh, uh, um, mixed or incubated with the tumors, and you, and you want to look for the ones that uh, have T-cells that are active against the tumors, then you, you enrich for them, and you, select, you expand them, and then you lymphodeplete the patient, and then you uh, reinfuse these T cells, which are these tills which express uh, anti, uh, uh, which are targeting tum tumor uh, new antigens. And this is being tried. It's of course very expensive. It is not. Uh, there are no examples of uh, of approved products. The next is of course a highly exciting CAR T cell therapy, and here is where we have products in the in the clinic. And here I'm showing you an NT-CD19 CAR T cell for B cell, B, B, B uh, expressing ALL or B lymphocyte uh, malignancies. Uh, of course, not uh, relevant to a surgical crowd, but basically what happens here is that a patient with refractory uh, ALL or, or uh, DLBCL will undergo leukapheresis, take out these uh, T cells. Uh, T cells are genetically engineered to have carry this chimeric um, 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 antigen. And this chimeric antigen actually recognizes CD19, which is only expressed on B cells. And then you add on a couple of elements to, uh, to give it co-stimulatory uh, pathways, uh, signals, for example, 41BB, which is CD137 and CD3. And then you infuse the, the CAR T cells back into the patient after lymphodepletion, and you can see a remarkable response. And, there, and these patients, uh, and this therapy actually carries a high uh, uh, a high incidence of CRS, or what you call cytokine release syndrome. If you, you see good CRS, you see good response. Uh, so this is on-target effect. Now I think, and this is my personal opinion, I think that bispecific T-cell engagers are going to replace CAR T-cells, simply because they are off-the-shelf solutions. You don't have to uh, take out the patient's T-cells and, and, and by leukophoresis and so on. So basically, these are antibody constructs where the two variable chains, as you all know, there's a, the two, two, it's like a Y arm, right? So one arm carries uh, 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 the, the epitopes that can, can uh, the sequences which can recognize CD3, which is found on the surface of all T cells. The other arm carries a variable chain which can recognize the tumor antigen on, which is expressed on the on the surface of the, of, the, of the tumor cells. Okay, and so what it essentially does is it's like a linker molecule that brings a T cell in close proximity to the tumor and then kills the tumor. And here I give you the example of AMG160 developed by Amgen. And this is essentially a PSMA bite uh, where one arm is CD3, so bringing a T cell in close proximity to PSMA, which is prostate-specific membrane antigen. And, um, and therefore, linking them together and causing the T cell to engulf the, or cross lysis of the tumor cell. So essentially, uh, the advantages are you can make T cells recognize any tumor cell surface antigen. Two, you don't need an MHC class 1 antigen, and you, don't need, you just need a peptide antigen for recognition. You do not need a T cell clone, so you don't have to leukophoresis the patients. Again, these products have a high risk of cytokine release as a result of uh, on-target effects. Okay, now I would uh, submit to you that the most promising and the most exciting development is in the uh, area of cancer vaccines. And these cancer vaccines essentially work by developing uh, the, or priming the immune system of the host against specific tumor antigens that are expressed only by tumor cells. And it consists of three elements. All vaccines consist of three elements. One element is the antigen, the tumor neoantigen. Second is a delivery system. And the third is an adjuvant. So if you have all, all these constructs, all have these three basic elements, whether you give the, the construct as a DNA, which will go into the, the, the host and express the pro tumor protein antigen that, that, that causes a T cell, incites a T cell reaction, or you give it in the form of an RNA, or you give it in the form of a peptide, it all achieves the same goal of activation of the T cells. Now, one other way of doing this is by 
removing the patient's dendritic cells. As I told you, the dendritic cells are the antigen, the professional antigen presenting cells. So if you could isolate the, the, the dendritic cells from the patients, ex vivo prime them or pulse them with tumor antigens, and then reinfuse these uh, dendritic cells into the patients, you can incite a tumor response. And this is probably one of the most potent ways of giving a vaccine. In our center, we've actually done a study like this, where we use a CD137 ligand dendritic cell, which recognizes EDV peptides. And this is done in uh, association uh, or collaboration with Herbert Schwartz from Physiology. Basically, we isolate patients with uh, nasopharyngeal cancers, refractory to treatment, uh, get apheresis, we isolate the, the CD137 ligand expressing dendritic cells and then pulse them with EBV and then return them by intradermal uh, uh, injection and where we, we, we just sent off the, the, the manuscript and we are waiting for the, what, what the, the reviewer says. Okay, um, I'd like to expand this by telling you that we are currently in the era of personalized vaccines. Um, how this works is as follows. We, we harness the impact and the technology of next generation sequencing to pull out the tumor, the specific host specific tumor, um, new antigens and develop vaccines against them. And this has been done. And in fact, your COVID-19 vaccine is the result of all this experimentation that has been done. It just happened that COVID-19 came at that point of time and the, the, the people who are doing this were right poised in the right place and right time to develop a vaccine. In fact, your COVID-19 vaccine is pretty much very simple compared to what we, is being done in, uh, uh, in these experiments. So basically, this is what happens. You have a tumor that contains a whole heterogeneity of cells that express various tumor neoantigens. You conduct whole exome sequencing in the tumor of the, of the tumor. You do RNA sequencing and DNA sequencing. You match them and you pick out the tumor neoantigens, so you have a pile of them. Then you do HLA genotyping of the patient. You use an algorithm to predict anti a peptide presentation based on this HLA uh, uh, alleles. You identify the, mutation, the mutations and neoantigens. You select the optimal ones. You develop a vaccine, and you administer the vaccine. Amazing space age work. Does it work? It jolly well does. So there are two groups in this world who have done this, published in Nature in 2017. One, the Boston group with Neovax using 20 long peptides of expressed tumor neoantigens against melanoma. Four uh, stage three patients, four of them disease-free after 32 months, two metastatic recurred but later had complete response. Apparently, seven patients are in complete remission five years after treatment. So amazing uh, outcome. The second, of course, you recognize BioNTech is the group led by Uga Sahin, where they use, instead of using peptides, they are here using mRNA, and you're all very familiar with this. The mRNA, and mRNA construct is injected in the form of a lipid nanoparticle to patients, and two out of five patients objective response, and one complete response. So you can see that we're moving from the era where we use whole cell lysates for development of vaccines, all the way to now we have personalized tumor mutation based antigen uh, identification and personalized vaccination. And you can therefore see tumor response increasing with increasing um, specificity. I just want to leave you with one last slide. And this is specifically for the surgeons. Okay, so we have to listen to this slide. The most important thing is collection of the most representative tumor tissue. From, the, from my prior uh, presentation, you will recognize that it is highly important for us to be able to collect tissues that we can use for next generation sequencing. And now we have technologies that are, that are able to spatially understand the tumor microenvironment. And what do I mean by that? Basically, imagine this. I can take a whole tumor and I can separate out the cells and I can do single cell RNA sequencing all on one platform and on the top of the tumor, so it's spatial. So it gives you two, two informations, two, two pieces of information. One, what is the identity of that particular cell? And two, where it lies in, the, in respect to the other cells in the tumor microenvironment. How, how, how good can that be? Essentially, pathologists may soon become uh, not wanted anymore. 
You just need one platform. I can tell you where the tumor is coming from. I can tell you the, the tumor mutations. I can tell you what, what molecular defects the tumor is, uh, is, is carrying. And I can develop a vaccine against it. How good can that be? Of course, it costs money. Okay, so basically, my, my take-home message to surgeons is if us and medical oncologists tell you to try and cut out a piece of tissue, please help us. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Prof. Go, for that uh, really illuminating talk. Really a huge uh, armamentarium of um, drugs and technologies that are at our disposal now. Um, maybe another question is, if we are seeing a patient on um, immunotherapy in clinic, uh, let's say someone uh, receiving PD-1 uh, treatment, what are some things in the history and physical examination that we can look out for other than, of course, the primary tumor site? You mean to predict... Um, uh, not so much for response prediction, but um, maybe uh, in terms of side effects. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. In terms of side effects, okay. It is at this point of time almost impossible to predict who is going to uh, develop side effects to treatment um, from immune checkpoint inhibitors. But what we do know is that about 5% of patients treated with uh, PDL1 blockade will develop uh, some kind of a grade 3 to 4 immune related event. Um, and if you add on uh, anti CTLA4 treatment, then this goes up to about 20%. That uh, is the state of the situation. <laughs> but we're not surprised if patients develop like skin rash. We always tell them, look, this is a, this, these are side effects that. Um, are completely different from chemotherapy, right? So you get anything, I, basically this is how I tell a patient, you, anything from your head to your toe can get inflamed with immunotherapy, meaning it could be your thyroid gland, simple, okay? It could be your adrenal gland, again, very simple. But if it is the li if liver, the lung, or the colon, then it's not so simple. <laughs> mm. okay. Great, thanks. Yeah, go ahead first. Yeah. Yes, uh, uh, thank you, uh, Buncha, for the really excellent summary of this uh, important topic. And uh, I would like your last slide of uh, spatial transcriptomic. And um, I just uh, wonder, and, uh, what do you think the potential of this technology? And why do you think that it will be a, a, a game changer in uh, cancer discovery? Okay, so um, from a research point of view, it gives us an unprecedented insight in the, into the tumor microenvironment that we never had before. Uh, it can allow us to identify new cells that we never thought possible uh, present in the tumor. For example, recent papers uh, have shown that in hepatocellular carcinoma, there are some um, uh, myofibroblastic uh, cancer-associated fibroblasts or uh, uh, there's polarization towards a reprogramming to a fetal type phenotype which supports the tumor and leads to immune um, privilege. That means you don't, you, don't, you don't mount an immune response. So biology, very important. Number two is that it can give us um, an understanding of what mutations eventually are driving this, this tumor. Um, and we can then develop ways to overcome this. So again, that is applications-based uh, uh, to, to, to with, with regards to this technology. So we are very excited with this technology because it really gives us an unprecedented insight to, to what's happening actually at the level of the tumor microenvironment. Why is pancreatic cancer so difficult to treat, for example? Hopefully you will find out the answer. I enjoyed the talk. It is a formidable feat to try and summarize immunotherapy for any group of people in a short period of time. It's in and of itself, I guess, it can be a three-day symposium already. Uh, so, and I, and I completely agree with you that, you know, we eventually need to be, well, not even eventually, but now, looking at personalized care and very tumor-targeted type thing, whether it is the development of vaccines uh, or whether we harvest, for example, TILs, uh, uh, tumor infiltrating lymphocytes from a patient, say, and store them and then wait for a recovery and use that, and that's something that I'm also particularly interested in. I, I think uh, we should start to try to influence I th 
uh, medical student syllabus to look at things like tumor biology being a critical component of the syllabus rather than an atomic type study. Uh, we should look at residency programs, both surgical and radiation, medical oncology programs to study things like immunotherapy, chemotherapy, because we no longer go beyond that. Uh, it shouldn't be confined to the see a solid tumor, cut it out kind of phenomenon. But with that, I also want to say the last comment. I hope that, uh, I mean, and I've always told the surgical oncologists in my division previously when I was there, that it should be they themselves who should be telling the medical oncologists, we are going to be harvesting the tumor. Do you happen to want any for any of the studies? Because it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be, it has to be multidisciplinary in that sense. Like, and I, I think, yeah. Thanks, Melissa. I think that is absolutely appropriate comment because we essentially, if we are caught um, in a, by surprise, you're going to cut out a tumor tomorrow, then we cannot, ha we cannot harness our, our resources together. And what we really need, for single cell RNA sequencing, uh, we really need fresh tissue. And that really is, you have to process it on the spot. The same day has been, you have to basically pass out all the different uh, cell types. So you have to do flow cytometry on the tissue. The second is that you have to, uh, one sample has to go into frozen. So again, if you don't have your liquid nitrogen there, you know, ischemia time is high, it, all the antigens will disappear. And then of course, the last thing is uh, uh, FFPE, which is it's simpler, right? We just collect the FFPE. But the, the platforms are becoming better and better such that actually FFPE will yield a huge, hey, we heard of that this morning, absolutely. So <laughs> FFPE actually gives you a lot of information. The, the platforms are being used by NanoString and uh, 10X Genomics, they are really, uh, focusing on FFP sections now. So I think we are pretty good. Yeah, actually. I think we're, we're getting there. I mean, even in private practice, just this week alone, I harvested tumour for a medical oncologist in public service. So it's possible. Every awesome. tumour that's taken out and there's no tissue harvested is a waste of that specimen. Yeah, please that. give us some. <laughs> <laughs> Money is the key. Yeah. <laughs> are there further questions from the floor or online? Okay, we do, we do have one question uh, from Kuo Wei. It says, lovely talk, thank you. Any opinion on the combination of immunotherapy with chemotherapy and potential for synergism? Yes, so um, the idea is chemotherapy can cause cell lysis and release of tumor antigens and therefore potentiate and give better opportunity for T cell priming uh, against the tumor. And that actually has been shown in a certain way in non-small cell lung cancer where um, the first line therapy is now replaced by chemotherapy plus immunotherapy uh, in, in, in most patients that don't even express PDL1. So again, that has actually been shown. Uh, and increasingly, that is being shown in gastric cancer. Uh, increasingly, that is being shown in a couple of other malignancies, not melanoma, because unfortunately, melanoma doesn't respond to chemotherapy. So, you know, so it, yeah, in tr short, yes, absolutely. We have another one from Mark Rindran. Uh, should we bank all cancers that we excise? I mean, my short answer to that is yes. Of course. <laughs> of course. The neurosurgeons will bank all their tumours. The pancreatic surgeons will bank all their tumours. Head and neck surgeons, please bank your tumours. Call us. So I think with, with, with that, um, I guess we, we have a take-home message. <laughs> um, I think if there are no further questions, we will move on to the last talk of the session. I'm